the potatoes going around, so I'm going to give you the answers very quickly. So you can talk to your friends about them later on. Uh, the first one states, the mother of civil rights movement said, we who believe in freedom cannot rest. Alabama. Mama string bean cursed like a sailor, yet her robes and movies were always of a sweet colored woman. Apple Waters. She sculptured the image of Franklin Roosevelt on the dime. A Thelma Burke. Norman Rockwell painted the scene of her integrating the school. And the, it was on the Saturday evening post, and it was the problem we all lived with. Anyone remember that? That was Ruby Bridges. She went to school the entire year by herself in New Orleans in 1963-64. Catwoman who protested the Vietnam War at the White House. Eartha Kitt. Mm. This is for uh, the Super Head Beauty was known as the color of Marilyn Monroe. You can look up Joyce Brown. The model who's too black for America but perfect for Europe in the 50s. Helen Williams. Ken Byrne used this group to sing, We Who Believe in Freedom Cannot Rest, in many of his documentaries. It's a group out of Washington, D.C. Sweet Honey in the Rock. Sweet Honey in the Rock. Uh, she said this, and everybody should know this. I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Fanny Lou Hamilton. Marilyn Monroe wanted to look like her. Hollywood you scrub, both of them. Dorothy Daniels. Tennis champion of the 50s and the 60s. Gibson. Thea, Thea Gibson. She said, and this started in Rocky Mountain in 1962. She said, what about the dream? Tell them about the dream, Martin. When he was giving his speech in uh, Washington, D.C., August of 63, it was failing, it was going over the people's head, they was hot and tired. And my, my Hayden Jackson had just got through singing, and she's the one that said, tell them about the dream. And the dream was first spoken here at Booker T. Theater, I mean Booker T. Washington High School in 1962. There was a play here at the Imperial Center. Uh, one of her schools still stand in Whitaker's, North Carolina. Julia Brick. My grandmother graduated from Brick. And she used to tell me as a child, she said, you know, I graduated from Brick. I'm a Brick graduate. And you know, the strangest thing about that, um, my great-grandfather was a slave, and he sent five of his children to Brick Monday through Friday. They would get on a train in Bakersfield and get off up in Whitaker's. And the youngest, uh, she graduated from Shaw University. She taught school in Halifax County. Uh, she lived on um, Atlanta Avenue, Mrs. Uh, uh, Hawkins. And she graduated from Shaw University. Uh, her father told producer Samuel Golden, Golden Metro Miles, I can hire a daughter for a maid. She doesn't play one. <clears throat> Cabin in the sky. Stormy weather. <laughs> the, oh, the once named no hit trio replaced the Beatles as number one on the billboard in the summer of 64. The Supreme, they couldn't get a hit, they became a famous in the summer of 64 with Word That I Love Go, and knocked the Beatles off the charts. <laughs> An opera singer who gave up her career to support her civil rights and lead her husband. Skaratakoski. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt invited this educator to the White House many times. Mary McLeod Bethune. 
songwriter and singer Carol King say, if this is too blatant, they always give us a hit. They were all in high school together. Carol King and the Sherrells. <laughs> you know, Soldier Boy, Will You Still Love Me Tomorrow? The first black United States supermodel, Naomi Sims. This was a raise in the business when I was a child. Twelve-year-old correctly spelled anti-disesterimentarianism on the quiz program, $64,000 question. Gloria Lockridge. Tessanini was a great um, music composer and conductor, and he praised her voice, but the daughters of the Reverend Lucia said, do not allow her to sing in the Constitution Hall. Mary Nance. She was the real rose. She was the real <laughs> yellow rose of Texas. Emily Morgan. She was she was black. That's where you get high yellow from. So <laughs> she wasn't white as you see it portrayed in the movies. Okay. They said that she said this, and a lot of times people always like to quote it. They are my they are my kind, but not my kin. This is already up Thurston. Doctor who graduated from Booker T. Washington High School in Duke University. Doctor Brenda Armstrong. Uh, she said, "When someone is some, when someone shows you who they are, the first time believe them." Maya Angelou. Her novel, The Wedding, was edited by Jacqueline Kitty O'Nassa. Dorothy West. She was last of the Renaissance writers, Langston Hughes and all of those were her contemporaries. And here's a bonus question. <coughs> Blank was the name of the slave ship that brought the first Africans to Virginia Colony in the year of 1619 was the year. What was the name of the ship? <laughs> the name of the ship was the White Lion. Okay. Blank was the name of Wonder Woman's black twin sister. Wonder Woman had a twin sister. She was black. They are Dada twins. Nubia. <coughs> They have two versions of her being twins. One is the fact that Diana's mother was in love with two gods at the same time. One was Zeus and one was Hades. So she had babies by one god, Zeus. Diana's father is Zeus. Nubia's father is Hades. Then they have a version of it that she, one was made from black clay, and one was made from white clay. So this is, this is a little test you can play with your friends and give us some information, it's just fun. I've been doing this for 34 years. We, I did it the first time when Martin Luther King became a holiday. On Sunday we would get together with friends and drink and eat a whole lot of food. <laughs> So I said, let's have fun, let's do something differently. And I did a test and everybody enjoyed it. So year after year after year, when I lived in Baltimore, I would have to put a test together. So I put it together several times since I've been here at my church. Thank you.
We celebrate Black History Month in the shortest month of the year, but we know that our history is 365 days a year. Let us now pause for a brief acknowledgement of our Creator. Dear Lord and Father of us all, we come to you this evening thanking you for bringing us together. We acknowledge the spirit of our ancestors. We acknowledge the mythical Sankofa bird, the bird in Ghanaian history that has his feet firmly planted for the future and also looks back. We look back this evening in order to reclaim our history, dear God, and we thank you for that rich history. We thank you for our ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. We thank you for all the richness and the energy that is with us today. And we thank you for the hope for the future that is also present with us today. In the name of the Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer, let all who are gathered in this gathering say amen, 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 amen. 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 We welcome you this evening in the spirit of Sankofa, that is looking back so that we may move forward. And I'd just like to review the program with you. We will have a musical selection by the drum poet as well as a dance selection, followed by, I will set the context for you, after which we will have a panel discussion. Uh, after I set the context, then the panelists may come up uh, from Rocky Mountain historic African-American communities, after which we will have a performing artist. Then we will have a discussion on where do we go from here, followed by a leadership panel, and then a very important part, our call to action. I'd like to introduce to you at this time our musical selection by the drum pop prophet, Eugene Taylor, and accompanied by a dancer, Ms. Chastity Magnet. Thank you, thank you for that awesome introduction. <laughs> How's everybody? Yeah. 
give me the directions. A black man that developed neighborhoods, along with his partner, a carpetbagger from up north by the name of John Logan, who came into this community after, in a post-Civil War era. We got to reclaim our history to rebuild for our future. And we have many people here tonight who are going to tell you and share with you their experiences. Let's take a little trip down memory lane as far as some of the houses in this community and the historical significance of the property in this community. You see, there are so many cities, and you know, you've seen them here in North Carolina, right down the road in Raleigh, or in Charlotte, where African-American communities are no more, where there's not been equity in development, where low and moderate income neighborhoods have turned into upscale condominium communities. We had a balanced neighborhood at one point when our communities were segregated, but we thrived economically and we shared. We're going to have our elders here tonight to tell us more, those who live through it. But let's share with you a few addresses. 410 Atlantic Avenue. That was the site of the Rocky Mount Improvement and Manufacturing Company. Atlantic and Gold Leaf, one of the oldest buildings in this city, was the site of the American Tobacco Company. 409 Atlantic Avenue, the home of that carpetbagger I told you about, John Logan, who has been erased from the history of Rocky Mount. 422 Atlantic Avenue, the home of Clinton Battle, who was a postmaster and also a state legislator in Rock. 419 Albemarle Avenue, the home of William C. and Maggie Battle. That home was built in 1905. 407 Albemarle Avenue, right around the corner, the home of the first African-American firefighter. Home of his, his name was Logan Penny and his wife was Ellen North. 247 Atlantic Avenue. You know about this place, Angela. The site of R. Kelly Bryant and Brothers grocery store. You see, a and has nothing on us. We had our own stores. This is food for thought. So set in the context of beginning to reclaim our history and to reproduce our history so that our young people can know what a rich history we have and can know that we are more than impoverished communities. Even our campaigners who are running for president, you would think, listening to them, that the only thing in the black community is poverty and crime. We know we are more than poverty and crime. We are not, amen? We're not a monolithic people. And therefore, we have to look back to move forward. Look back to move forward. I will now ask the panel to come forward of elders. And our moderator, I will turn over to our moderator for this panel, Rocky Mount's Historic African American Communities, Mr. Lorenzo Ellis, to introduce the panel.
exist. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. My name is Lorenzo Ellis, and I grew up in <clears throat> Grand Avenue in what we call the neighborhood across town. My father and his brother, who lived next door to each other, James and Tom Ellis, were some of the top roofers in the area. Our black neighborhood was filled with black business, craft people, educator and professional, blue collar and service workers. We have a special panel for you tonight of some of the black history makers from the Crosstown neighborhood and communities. First, Ms. Jessica Jones, now 90 years old. She has been, she has lived in Rocky Mountain since 1941 and a graduate from Booker T. Washington High School in 1947. Her home house was on Thomas Street, across from St. James Baptist Church. She is a science educator, social activist. She served, she received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching from President George H.W. Bush. Second, Second, Mr. Guy Davis, also is 90 years old. And was in the class, Booker T. Washington High School, 1947, as well. He was my football coach, basketball, and tennis. In fact, he introduced me and many other youth in the neighborhood to the game of tennis. He is a renowned educator from a family of educators and grew up on the corner of Grand Avenue and Pennsylvania. He is a veteran and spent nine years in the Army during the career crisis. Family, Ms. Vanette Pittman Woods. Her family ran one of the historic black businesses in our community, Lincoln Park Hotel and Restaurant. Her father-in-law was one of the historic musicians and band directors from our community. She grew up on Albemarle Avenue and currently live in the home house now. She graduated in the Booker T class of 1965. Each of these history makers will answer three questions about the heritage of our Rocky Mount neighborhoods, taking two minutes each. And when they finish, they will take a few minutes to hear reflections and questions from a few of you in the audience as well. Angela will hold up, a hand, hold up her hand when you have about 30 minutes left to finish. The Actually, it's Savannah. Savannah. Sorry, Savannah. OK, the first question is, Give us a few important black history facts about the Crosstown neighborhoods and Holly Street communities. Let me repeat this again. <laughs> Give us a few important black history facts about Crosstown neighborhood and Holly Street communities. Let's start with Mr. Davis. <laughs> Thank you, Lorenzo. What, is this on? Yes, sir. Thank you, Lorenzo. Uh, going back to the early 40s. Put that mic can, can you? Okay. But going back to the early 40s, what is now known as the cross town section is not 
as what it was some years ago. Uh, cross town section, uh, generally thought to be from, from the railroad east. It uh, wound up somewhere around, somewhere around Woodland Avenue was about the extent. Now uh, Woodland uh, had, at least that was the city limits at that time, somewhere in that area, had a post that said uh, on Virginia Street that uh, that was the city limits. What is now Martin Luther King Park was completely outside of the city limits of Rocky Mountain. Okay. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think I, I was very proud of, and I imagine people during my time, was that the neighborhood was a place where almost any adult would school or discipline a child that went wrong. There were times when my neighbors would spank me, and the town was small enough that they could yell to my parents to tell them that I'm on the way home. <laughs> and by that time, I, I would get a, a spanking when I got home also. But uh, uh, people who come to town now, uh, <laughs> but, the, but uh, the thing is, it was a very close-knit group of families that lived in the neighborhood. And we, we all loved them, respected them, and, you know, just, uh, we did what they said to. There were two that were schools at that time. There were three schools in the neighborhood. There was Holly Street School, which was on the lower <coughs> end of Holly Street, or Pope that did not exist at that time. That was Holly Street, that was uh, Booker T. Washington High School, and Warpo. Okay, but uh, that was, those were the schools that we attended. And the good thing about it is that the teachers at that time lived in the community. They lived in uh, parents' homes and different places, and well, if you did something wrong, the teacher next, might be living next door to you. They didn't have to <laughs> say or call anybody. It was just that uh, they could yell across the street, the guy named did something wrong, which I did. <laughs> but but uh, it, it was a very close-knit area, and you know, we all loved one another. And that was it. That's part She can use that. Is it on? Ms. Jones. Thank, thank you, Mr. Ellis. You gotta put it <clears throat> close to your mouth. Okay. Very close. <laughs> All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> and looking at the theme that we have chosen for tonight, it says to me that you don't know where you're going until you know where you have been. So what I'm going to do at this point in time is to, to tell you where I have been in the religious aspect of Crosstown. I grew up in the 40s, so what I would like to tell you about are the churches that existed here during that time. The mere number and denomination that existed at that time indicated that the people living here knew that they would not be exiled from God. You couldn't miss a church there was one on practically every corner. And they're still there now. So we shouldn't have any problems about attending a church. Let's just start with um, one church. 
Well, Cross Town for me began at um, Thomas Street. I lived at first, I grew up at 530 East Thomas Street, directly across from St. James Baptist Church. So you know every time the doors open, I knew that. And in, in most cases, we had to go. St. James was and is a Baptist church. And we had so many denominations. We had the Baptists, Presbyterians, Holy, several ministries, tabernacles, and we had a non-denominational church. And we still have a denominational church in the city. St. James on Thomas Street, you walk a few blocks, and you had the Presbyterian Church, Mount Pisgah. Then you may walk another, maybe two or three blocks, go to Atlantic Avenue, and you have the AME Zion Church, St. John. You have East End Baptist Church. And to tell you about the, the way some of these churches were established, East End was there also on um, Highland, I believe. <laughs> okay. All right, and um, there were members from St. James Church who um, started uh, North End Baptist Church, which is on Carolina and East Grand Avenue. And then you have smaller churches that I have listed. I have the whole list here of all those churches. We also have the Catholic Church, the Immaculate Conception Church on Virginia Street. And we have the Episcopal Church. I believe it was on Ivory Street, mm -hmm. but right now, it's, um, it's in the parking lot of the event center. That's it. Mm -hmm. um, and we have the Holiness Church. Is that I get and the churches in Rocky Mount, I would say, were very dynamic. They were also determined. They were dedicated and discerning and discipline. And it reminds me of the church in, in Ephesus, if you know about that church. <laughs> I think she said I was finished. <laughs> okay. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about businesses in Rocky Mountain. <clears throat> and uh, Guyan and Jesse talked to you about earlier, the earlier history of Rocky Mountain. I'm not quite 90 yet. <laughs> not quite getting there. But <laughs> I'll talk to you about the businesses in the 50s and 60s because that's the time I grew up in Rocky Mountain. I grew up in the segregated portion of Rocky Mountain, which we all call Cross Town for the neighborhood. But um, even though we grew up in the segregated part and we didn't have access to Rocky Mountain in its entirety, we had a good, cohesive neighborhood. And when I was looking um, for information about businesses in Rocky Mountain that were African American owned and operated, I didn't realize how many there were until I started this process. I, my memory isn't that good, so I'm going to read to you the number of African-American businesses we had in the 50s and 60s in Rocky Mountain. We had two drug stores on Douglas Block. We had dentists, family doctors, and lawyers. We had three morticians. We had florists, 
seamstress and tailors. We had beauticians and barbers. Cab companies, we had two. And they were located at that time on the Douglas block. We had dry cleaners. Corner stores, and I'm sure all of you remember the corner stores. And if you went to Booker T, you knew about the Edwards store, if you didn't know about any other. We had service stations and auto mechanic shops. Insurance companies. Music teachers who gave lessons in their homes. Notaries. Electricians and home repairmen. And we had restaurants and motels. I can tell you a little bit about the restaurant and hotel because that was my father's um, place. That was the first restaurant in our section of Rocky Mountain where you could go and sit down with your family, have a meal in a dining room. It also had an area with a booth and um, stools at a, at a counter if you chose to do that. But there was the, the one thing that made it distinctive was there were motels attached to it. And if you're familiar with the Green Book, it's listed in the Green Book. And the Green Book is, or it was at that time, a guide for African Americans who traveled because we could not stay in the motels that everybody else stayed in. So basically, my understanding was, my two the understanding was that people used their, there were homes that would welcome travelers. So when the Lincoln Park Restaurant Motel was built and it was utilized, it was, um, it was a big deal in Rocky Mountain. Well, since my two minutes are up, I will pass it on to Thank you so much for the great information. Next question. What are some of the important reasons to preserve our neighborhood? Let me repeat. What are some of the important reasons to preserve our neighborhood? This time we'll let Mrs. Jones go first. It's very important that we preserve our neighborhood. Take a walk and just stroll down. It, it, it's, very, <clears throat> excuse me. it's very important that we preserve our neighborhood. If you just stroll down any street in Rocky Mountain, or in Cross Town Rocky Mountain, you may become a little depressed because we have so many of our houses that are boarded up or demolished or have been demolished or dilapidated or deteriorated. We need to preserve those houses, some of them. Some of the houses are very, very important to the residents who once lived there. You may say, you go away. Yes, you can come home. And many of the residents, residents of Cross Town just come and see maybe a place where their childhood home was. That's okay too. I, we need more markers. We have a marker for Mrs. Um, Annie Anna Brown, who's the founder of AKA Africa Afro Sorority Incorporated. A marker for Dred uh, Wimberly, and others to mark also for the uh, sanitation workers, and more that not enough of them we have for housing. We need to preserve housing in some way. 
if you tour many cities, usually there may be a particular house that um, they will show you. For example, when I was in South Africa, they took us to the house where Nelson Mandela and Whitney lived. It was a, just a four-room house. And um, it just made you get a different feeling of who the two persons are or were. So housing is one thing that we need to preserve our pride and also important individuals live in the, on this side of town. Such persons as Helen Gay during the time when I was growing up. Uh, Mrs. Eldera, um, Eldorada Hawkins. I believe she was the first black lady to run for city council. And uh, Reverend Dudley. Mm -hmm. We have, is that the auditorium at City Hall? Mm -hmm. It's named for him. Mm -hmm. Train station is named for Helen Gay, so it's important that we preserve that. And we have other homes that we might be able to get markers for. I'm thinking of the Mitchell home on Atlantic Avenue, maybe the Stokes home on Atlantic Avenue, and other homes, uh, the Burnett home on Pennsylvania, uh, the Bullock home on Pennsylvania. And it's just to preserve this part of the city. It gives you a sense of belonging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if we're not careful, mm -hmm. billionaires, we hear so much about billionaires nowadays, <laughs> could come and buy up all those houses That's right. that we see deteriorating. That's right. mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, this side of town will be commercial. Mm -hmm. And that is what we don't want to happen. I wouldn't like for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't like for your children or grandchildren um, not to know anything about this part of town if you live there. Mm -hmm. And I just look at those houses that are, are, are deteriorating. It's, it's depressing. because um, we want to preserve the legacy of the people who lived here. Mm -hmm. And if we don't do that, we'll just disappear. <coughs> so, and we're just talking about just one part of the city. <coughs> and there are so many other parts of the city that need to preserve. And we have so much pride in, in this side of town where we live and grew up and loved. And as she pointed out, the businesses that are here and that work here. And thank you very much. <laughs>
and gender that is depressing. Because the building is deteriorating, I mean, it's just depressing. But it had such historical presence and meaning that I wish, and I'm not going to say I would have kept my daddy's business, because I'm not a business person, but I wish someone would have um, preserved it so the other generations could see a black man and an uneducated black man owned and operated that business for 23 years. Mm. And I didn't tell you before, but well-known people stayed there. Mahalia Jackson, B.B. King, some of the people that were traveling in that era who could not stay in other motels, they, they stayed at Lincoln Park Motel. So it would be, it would have been wonderful for that building to have been preserved in some manner. There is a marker there, so I, I'm glad of that. But when we had so many service stations in, in our neighborhood, we had Lynch's, um, McLean, Mr. Hatfield, so gas. I mean, there were a lot of, of businesses like that. They're all gone. So the only way our young people are going to know about those businesses that were there is, uh, like Jesse said, maybe markers. There needs to be some kind of recognition. Um, an area in the in the event center somewhere that talks about those businesses that were there. And they were thriving businesses. They were good businesses. And the community supported them. That was the other thing that was so great about our community. We supported each other. We cared about each other. So if if I could have a wish to come true for Rocky Mountain, it would be to remember the past. Remember those places and those things that we had where we couldn't have anything else. And they were done well, people enjoyed them, and I'm just sorry that a lot of those businesses are no longer there. Thank you. Let me, I don't know whether I'm supposed to start next day, <laughs> but uh, as, I, as I'm sitting right here now, looking at the back of uh, this room, one of the, well, this, uh, uh, this theater used to show some of the best movies that you ever want to, that you hear about. And, And whether you know or not, right in this projection room, that little square up there on the back, was a projection room. And I learned, I learned how to uh, set that projector up right in this, this room. There were, there were lots of uh, uh, businesses, there were the uh, uh, shoe repairs, drugstores, photographers, uh, was it Mr. Bellamy that ran a cab company? There was just loads of, in one little block, two blocks really, there was almost any kind of business that you'd want to, you know, be involved with. Restaurants, uh, night, night uh, clubs at least. And it was all, it was all very meaningful. But well, people would come from out of town and surrounding areas just to walk this block, what it was known as, this block around the corner. And even during the uh, June German time, when people would come from all over the country, if uh, years ago if you said Rocky Mount, I'm out, I'm told. But if you said Rocky Mount, people knew that you were talking about a nice place for folk to be. Thanks again for that historic information. Oh, I mean, Mike. <laughs> Thanks again for that historic information. So now we will move on and we'll go to the panel. Thank you so much for being on our panel tonight. 
and let's give our black history makers a big hand. have inspired you to work for the preservation and the uplift of our historic neighborhoods. Now, um, what questions or reflections do we have from the audience? We can take a few questions and comments. Andrew will bring the mic around for you. Please take just one minute for your questions or comments. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. Good evening. How did integration hurt the black community? Or did it hurt the black community? Thank you so much for that comment. One thing we've lost our history. When we think of um, when uh, when we think of what we learned when I was in high school, we had black history, and we don't have it. I don't know whether they have it now or not, but um, you don't have it in every school. So that's the major thing I would say. Our children do not know their history. Do we have another? Would you like to respond to that? Well, I'd like to just like to say one uh, that I can talk without this. But uh, integration was something I think that had to happen. We were just as proud as we could be of uh, what we were doing, but there were so many more things that could be done. And it, 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 it's like uh, folk have said over the years, a closed hand lets nothing new in and nothing out. But you need to expose yourself to things about you things in the world. It's more than just uh, rock and out in the world. And mm. a lot of times it's kind of difficult to, you know, move away and grow. But uh, the military, I think, helped a lot of people. For me, it, it uh, exposed the world, things <coughs> that I've seen in, in uh, books and everything. And it, it, it broadened my scope tremendously. Now, it, integration, uh, uh, I think it was just one of those things that just have, just had to be. If we as black folk were going to be exposed, because if, if we stay in our little communities, then uh, it's almost like they said China was. They were walled in, and uh, for years, they didn't, their knowledge or uh, their uh, culture didn't exceed those walls. So they were kind of standing. And the same thing with us, I think, is that we needed to broaden our scope. And so many of us now are in different positions, you know, uh, uh, because we were able to broaden our scope to go beyond just rock them out. Uh, just the state. We became world, uh, you know, worldwide uh, intelligent about worldwide things. So integration, I think, we hate to lose our small little cubby hole that we were in, but we needed to broaden ourselves, I think. Do we have another question? I'd like to comment on this question about whether or not integration was good or bad. I think there's something good and something bad going on there because 
The good part was exactly what Guy said. It broadened our scope. It exposed us to some other things. But the bad part of it was we, we embraced it to the point that we forgot. We forgot to still embrace our culture and celebrate our culture. So I think it was good and bad. But hopefully we'll reclaim our, our heritage and our culture. I'd like to say that integration in Rocky Mount, the truth be told, hurt us more than it happens. And the reason was because with integration, we lost control. The very thing that Ms. Alice, Mr. Ellis was telling you about, if he did something wrong, his mama knew about it before he got home. Because the entire, Mr. David, the entire neighborhood raised you. You had all the businesses that Ms. Pittman and the rest of them have talked about. And the neighborhoods supported them. And everybody supported each other in raising their children, in their churches, in their community, whatever you did, you did together. With integration, all of a sudden, we wanted to be somebody else. Hmm. So we lost our own identity. In many communities, if you look at other races, They fought for equality, but they only wanted the money, the education, and the opportunity. They kept their neighborhoods. You don't believe it, go to a Jewish neighborhood. If you don't believe it, go to Atlanta. When they wanted to go to a white neighborhood, what did they do? They bought the neighborhood. Okay? With us, when we do, when we do well, we've got to understand that we can buy our own properties, even if we don't want to live there. Um, who was it? Okay. Yes. much everyone and I hope we have helped increase your pride appreciation and concern for our historic neighborhoods should I repeat that again I hope we have helped increase your pride appreciation and concern for our historic neighborhoods thank you as the panel with parks, the tailors will be coming up, after which we will have a discussion where we, where we go from here. Thank you so much, panelists of elders. Taylor. Um, I spent a lot of time in this beautiful community through my work at Legal Aid. I managed the Office of Legal Aid of North Carolina. And if you're in the Community Academy or in the Stirring Community, community Academy, can you raise your hand or stand up? <laughs> well, I do want to give a shout out to them because, I mean, they're, this what I'm about to do is dedicated to them. 
They inspire me to do this. This is not what I normally do, but I belong to a talented family, so <laughs> it's strictly <laughs> on me to do this. Um, okay, do this <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. This is Eugene Taylor, my husband, and my daughter, Chloe Taylor. <laughs>
stop with just a couple of comments. Where do we go from here? God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. God grant me the courage to change the things I can change. Where do we go from here? We continue to push, we continue to build, we continue to succeed. I pray that the Lord Jesus Christ will continue to bless us with strength, direction, perseverance, due diligence, and love. Where do we go from here? Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Build for God's glory. Testify for God's glory. Godliness and contentment is great gain. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Look, looking back to move forward. Looking back to move forward. Looking back and moving forward. Yes. Looking back yeah. and still moving forward. Yeah. Looking yeah. back and getting all that knowledge that's behind you and still moving forward and doing what you have to do. Looking back and still moving forward. Where do we go from here? We continue to push. We continue to build. We continue to succeed. God has blessed us with a new team of builders. He has. He has blessed us with a new team of builders. God has blessed us. He's blessed us with a new team of builders. Everybody in this room is a builder. God has blessed us with a new team of builders. We pray that this new team will put on the whole armor of Christ. The whole armor, all of it, every piece of it. We pray that this new team will put on the whole armor of Christ and that we will stand as one body. One body pushing forward to accomplish what we need. One body united, refreshed, and renewed and ready to move forward into the new venture. I stand to introduce my sister friend, Sister Susan Perry Cole, president of the North Carolina Association of CDCs, and a new Sue that God has blessed with a new energy. I recognize that. Um, something has happened to all of us, and he's building a new energy among Amen. all of us. Amen. He is building a whole new energy. He's in here now. Amen. He's in here now. He really is. Amen. He brought the elders back Amen. to talk to us. You know, he's got young folks here to talk to us. Amen. And so what we have to do is listen. Mm -hmm. We do. We have to listen now. We have to listen. We have to pay attention. We have to pay attention. And we have to come together as one group of people, all geared toward pushing toward the future for our children, you know, for our children. I, I'm, I'm real glad to be here tonight. I've been under the weather some, I've been dealing with my sister some, but somehow or the other, there's a new energy in this place. There's a new energy in this place. There's a new energy in this place. And we just have to stand firm, push as hard as we can push, fight as hard as we can fight, and do the best that we can. God is with us, y'all. Lord Jesus Christ is with us. And what we have to do is just continue to stand, continue to fight, and continue to know that we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. There's nothing we can do. So I wouldn't stray, but I'm going to stray right off the top. Off the top. You know, um, God tells you to do things, and you feel like saying, Who, what? 
<laughs> me. And I had a lot of thoughts about this program because God spoke to me and he asked me to do something. And it was real clear in my head and it was very clear that we needed to hear from the maturity of our elders. And we need to do a lot more listening to each other. Amen. That's one thing I got out of tonight. The other thing is I'm so glad that Natalie started off with prayer because I, I, we didn't have it on the program. Well, I'm going to ask my pastor, TJ, if you will close us out with a benediction and lead us also in singing the song at the end, because you're a singer and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm going to go to these comments because there's a couple of things that I, I need to say to you. We are observing Black History Month tonight. And doesn't it feel good? Yes. Yeah. 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 And you do with that drum. You can brought it right into the room, right from the very beginning. And Black History Month goes back to 1926, I think Tom told us that, with Carter G. Woodson and the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. And it was supposed to be the second week of February, it was called Negro History Week back then. You graduated from that term. There's a richness and diversity to the African American experience in this country. But to be honest and to recognize TJ's question, it's bittersweet. It's full of joy and happiness, but it includes a great deal of pain, shame, and generational trauma. Both for ourselves and for those who have sought to own us and to oppress us. But according to tonight's team theme, looking back to move forward, it's appropriate for us to come together as a community, create dialogue, and discuss those things that might repair the harm and spark reconciliation. And there's one other thing I need to say, and I'm going to say this twice. The best remedy for overcoming our collective pain and shame is intentionally working to build trust amongst ourselves. So let me say it again. The best remedy for overcoming our collective pain and shame is intentionally working to build trust amongst ourselves. The elders told us they loved each other back then, and they cared about each other, and we have to revive that spirit. Tonight we were blessed. Weren't we blessed with their memories? Yes. The, they spoke to us out of their own experience of actually living and working in the past of our historic black neighborhood. But in, then through their voices, we got the story underneath the story. You're not going to find this in the history books. We had to hear it from the people who lived it. And they lived under deeply constraining circumstances of racial segregation. And in many respects, we're still behind those bonds. Only this time, they're economic bonds. Mm -hmm. Why it is important right now that these residents talk to us about their lives, remember the details, clarify that which is confused, and make connections among seemingly disconnected recollections about their past social experience? Well, look, sitting here tonight in the Booker T Theater, and I love when he said, right up there. <laughs> in the Booker T Theater, we can all affirm Rocky Mount is a city in the midst of transformation. The signs of change are most visible in the city's downtown district. The revitalization potential is increasing rapidly for nearby neighborhoods along the Arlington Street corridor, and I live in one of those neighborhoods. We also know that people invest in their landscapes, so the buildings and the artifacts that exist in our African-American communities today can powerfully tell the story of our identity as a people what it all meant then, and what it all means now. <laughs> Natalin spoke to us about some research that was coming to our possession. And we now know that some of the oldest homes in downtown Rocky Mountain date back to the 1890s and are located right in the African American neighborhoods that we've been discussing tonight. There may very well be a treasure trove of these homes, as many as 100 to 200, historically significant properties that exist in the segregated and disinvested neighborhoods. But with the momentum for capital investment, 
which is building in downtown Rakhinao, and the pace of construction or renovation expected to climb, there is no guarantee that the historic residential structures that exist today will continue to stand tomorrow. That's why we who believe in economic justice, inclusion, and shared prosperity must become incredibly proactive. We must become incredibly proactive right now. We have to accept our role to serve as the voices and the visionaries of our African American neighborhoods if we expect to preserve our valuable cultural and historic heritage. It touched me when somebody said, people used to come from all around here because there was something here to attract them. And I want you to know, in this report, this land use study, which was adopted by the City Council in October of this year, it talks about creating this area as a center of African, well, African American heritage tourism. This has value, y'all. And the longer it, it, it stands, the more valuable it's going to be. It tells a story. The story is bigger than the Bruno. We are part of the story. So we made a contribution to building this community, and we're still making a contribution. We must lift that up. Not so much for ourselves, but for our children. It's a source of pride. It's a source of dignity. And it tells that we are survivors, and we know what to do with a little. Some residents of the most disadvantaged neighborhoods in Rocky Mountain have already come together to improve housing, health, and other conditions in our communities. We're using a community-driven process, and the group is called the Community Academy. You have a brochure on your table. This is, announces the next meeting of our Community Academy, which is open for anyone to come free of charge. If you signed up tonight, you will receive a notice from us, but I want you to spread the word because it's very important that we educate ourselves and we take time out to talk amongst ourselves, to learn and to plan. The Community Academy is building a strong grassroots base and leveraging their collective power. You see, in unity we have collective power to increase the voices of marginalized residents who historically have been excluded from the decision-making process. We can't sit down now, y'all. We have to come to the city council meetings, and we have to hold our leadership accountable. We we'll say that in front of them. We have to hold our leadership accountable. That's why they have been invited here tonight. So there are people in this room who joined with the Community Academy to get this study done. This was not developed by the city council or city staff. This was developed from the voices of you all who spoke at a community gathering. And then we did research. There are over 40 recommendations in this report, and we want to stand with you to make sure that these recommendations get implemented. But this is a framework to regulate the future growth of our neighborhood. So we do have the beginning of a roadmap. And we can do this in other neighborhoods as well. But we have to be proactive. We can't wait for others to take charge of our neighborhoods. We have to take charge ourselves. Are you with me? Yes. All right. One of the things that's in this report that we learned about, because you told us when you met at tri Faith, Faith uh, Church, that you wanted to preserve the legacy of your heritage. So we did research, legal aid did research, and we came up with this thing called a character district. A character district is less restrictive than a historic district. It's a zoning tool to preserve, protect, and enhance the general quality and appearance of an established older residential neighborhood by regulating certain building characteristics. We gotta protect this. You can't recreate a building to be 100 years old from scratch. We have it and we got to protect it. It can be used to discourage demolition of existing housing and limit construction to certain architectural types. Before such a district can be created, the city staff will be required to meet with all affected property owners so you can have 
your say. We are talking with city staff now to come out into the neighborhood and explain these things, break it down to the level where we can understand it. Because you can understand it if people don't talk over your head. Am I right? right. And you know what you want, right? right? And our job is to come together and raise our voices. I want to end with this. And remember this. Voices have power. Say it with me. Voices, voices have, have power. power. Say it one more time. Voices, voices have, have power. power. Put that in your heart. We can get anything we want. That's Stick together. Right. Stand together and support our leadership. Thank you. of this theater, which was this, we didn't even have a dream at that point of the event center. Um, however, the issue of historic preservation and reclaiming our history was a significant part of this plan and is going to have to be going forward a part of making this uh, economic development successful. So our first question for the panel tonight is to have them to share with us a story of their vision for downtown development. Describe what they see happening and what they see 
resulting? That's our first question for them. And they want us to start with the new members. We need to pass those mics down. So, between the new members, who wants to go first? You want to go first? Council person Walker? Yes, ma'am, that's fine. Okay, and we'll come on back. Okay. Good evening again. Good evening. Uh, I'm only 28 years old, so my first-hand experience from downtown may differ very uh, from some of you all in the room today. But my remembrance of downtown, the only thing that I can remember was the Carlton House. And uh, when I was younger, I knew that going to the Carlton House Every Sunday, you will see everybody in the community. You will see people from both sides of the track. And everybody would be in the same place. But you had a sense of unity and a sense of belonging to a community. Um, and that's my most uh, rich history of, of downtown as far as my first-hand experience. So as far as my vision for downtown, I want to see downtown uh, get back to that place place where everybody can feel like they belong uh, in the city. Just recently we had the food truck rodeo. You had people from all over the city, even people from out of town, that were standing uh, downtown in front of the event center, just enjoying each other, embracing Rocky Mountain. And uh, Rocky Mountain at that time, downtown, just seemed like such a vibrant, great place. So I want to be able to see uh, Rocky Mountain get back to that vibrant place. And how we do it, I believe we have to have uh, mixture of minority businesses as well as uh, other businesses and other races, but we have to be able to work together and we have to be able to, as as a people, and I, I hate to say we're the minority uh, because in Rocky Mountain we're not the minority, but uh, as a black people, we have to be able to uh, tap into our resources, work together so that we can have a vibrant black business downtown because if downtown is really going to develop, it's going to take black people to do it. We are the city, we're the majority of the city, and without us, it will not happen. So I'm looking forward to downtown really developing and booming and getting to the place that I desire uh, it to be. Amen. My first process of downtown, uh, I grew up in the county, up in around Robinsonville area, and one of the persons that stayed, uh, that was from Robinsonville, had a, uh, had a, a store here and uh, had a gas station. And we would come to Rocky Mount for get back to school clothes. Mm -hmm. And really, my father and mother was from Rocky Mount. And really, that was the time that we got to see all the family. Mm -hmm. And we got to go to, to black eateries and we got to see black businesses. Right. Because out in the rural area, you didn't really see black businesses. And that was the real hope that we would come and we would always go by Mr. Clemens by his, his gas station because he was a member of our church and it was good to see somebody black with a gas station. And it was really awesome. And as TJ said that the, I have this vision of downtown with this real vision of, of a food place, a processing place, where people can come and process their foods, food trucks can come. The rodeo was when I saw people from Clark and Branch and other communities that don't normally come downtown. That night, I think that preachers, everybody parted all night long. It was a beautiful time of us on the streets and we did not call one police officer. Not one incident. And we had a beautiful town. My vision of downtown is, is and this not to be the rock to nobody, is not that I have to pass downtown and go to the meals, but I can stop downtown and recognize the people that I'm growing up with. And that's my vision of downtown. Because when I see our communities come out of our communities to celebrate each other, we go back peacefully. Thank you. Good evening. This is a great evening. Uh, I just want to thank the organizers for 
know that you're doing a great job with the vision that you had in bringing us together and creating so many level, levels of connection. Um, I'm not from Rocky Mount, and I came here in the 80s, and I moved here uh, from, from Baltimore, even I'm from Roxborough, my mom is here right here, she told me not to call her name, and she knows better. <laughs> but um, I came from a small town, and then I lived in a big metropolis. And when I was, I was a young man, I was 25 years old. And what you do in the city, you always go downtown, right? right. And so the first thing I did when I moved to Rocky Mountain was I came downtown. This was in the mid 80s. And it was dead as a doorknob for me. I don't know, I never experienced this vibrant downtown that people talk about Rocky Mountain being. So I never had a vision about what was past because I didn't experience it. But when I got here and connected myself intentionally to black people and black communities and black churches, um, I began to understand that Rocky Mount has a depth of richness, of diversity, of intelligence, of incredible skill. And when I began hearing about all the history that existed and then looked at the facades that the history was created in, then I said, something different has to happen. And so being privileged to be supported by the community and being elected and working with incredible visionaries and civil rights leaders like Mr. Knight, Ms. Bryant, uh, Lamont Wiggins, and now with Richard and young leader on the rise, TJ, what I'm be beginning to understand is that we have something here that very few places in the country possess. Um, I heard Ms. Woods talk about the black businesses that used to be. Well, did you know Rocky Mount has at least 33 black-owned businesses downtown right now? This is not the past. I'm talking about right now. We have real estate developers, we have physicians, we have educators, we have attorneys, we have incredible wealth and resources within our reach. And while other cities tear down black business districts and then put up a sign and put up a new building, and I look at Durham, which was Black Wall Street, and the only thing black downtown Durham is that bull. <laughs> Come on now, educate. Rocky Mount has an incredible opportunity to not deny our blackness. There's nothing wrong with that. Right, right. There are people around the country who recognize what we're doing and want to link up with us. That's right. So this hotel, $60 million, that can happen right down the street, don't get twisted about this lying narrative that people will try to sell you and tell you that there's something wrong with that. It's nothing wrong with that. That's right. right. Talked yesterday, with two days ago, with one of the largest black law firms in New York. They want a part of Rocky Mountain. Come on now. Because they've heard what you have done. And they're connected to networks that are incredible around the world. So what I see, I'm excited. All right now. But y'all, we can't let other people come in and not be in the game ourselves. Mm. Come on now. So what I desire, my vision, is that we would have a black community that's not ashamed of our blackness, okay. hmm. that's celebrated, that don't feel that being black is a denial of being in a larger society. It's okay to be black and to be that's right. part of a greater. All right, all right. You understand that? <laughs> Everybody celebrates who they are. I desire that we are proud of who we are that we don't buy to this narrative that our neighborhoods are bad, we got to clean. Let me tell you something, we saw we got to clean it up. When we keep talking that narrative, we're saying that we need to tear it down and replace come it with now. something else. And we open the door for other people mm. to come in and take your land come on now. and recreate the possibility of a future. Yeah, we got to clean it up, but we can do that ourselves. Come on now. And we do that. That's my view. Quickly, so I can.
tell you my story. I want to see downtown a place for everyone to, to be able to work, live, and play. And I answer the question. Uh, what I hear from my constituents and other people, uh, more incentives uh, for uh, people to come downtown and to renovate and to develop of the property that was left over 20 years to sit there and became dilapidated. And so that's why I hear from my constituents. Now I'm going to switch the hat. Because I really would like to have been on that first panel because Ruby calls me, I guess, the historian. A lot of our older people have passed away. And I have a passion like Angela. Sometimes when I'm trying to research some history, I would call her and she got a room full of papers like I do. And then we would uh, collaborate. A lot of our older people have gone and their history was not recorded. It was pretty much all history. But looking back to move forward, you know, my mother grew up in Crosstown and Mr. Guy and David's mother lived on East Grand in Pennsylvania. My grandmother lived 516 Pennsylvania. I think she worked for Bob Melton. And they moved to Tanner Road, which was the country, and she married Mr. Daughter, which they owned all that land up to uh, Fountain Correctional Center. But she was an entrepreneur. She would cook potato jacks and pies and all that kind of stuff, and fried chicken, and take it down to uh, the tobacco factory, which we call Tobacco Town. She was an entrepreneur. And, I, and, and then my father grew up in Happy Hill, which is across the track. And I grew up in South Rocky Mountain, so I was able, I think I'm the last generation, to see the African American community um, the way it was in the, <clears throat> the 20s, the 30s, the 40s, the 50s, and 60s. I was born in 68 able to see older people walking to Foster Memorial uh, on Sundays at funerals and then visiting St. James and just seeing a community, a close-knit community acting like a community. We know it takes a village to raise a child. And so when I moved back to Rocky Mount, and I don't know how I ended up on Falls Road, which my father told me, don't never walk down Falls Road. As the cop said, don't never be, get caught on Falls Road because it was during that time. But end up with the crown jewel of that community. And ever since then, been painted as a militant black man, angry. But the only thing I wanted to do, like Andrew, was to provide services for our people because they were aging and they needed a quality place to spend the rest of their lives. And so from there, I hooked up with North End, with Reverend Lee, with the NAACP. <laughs> and then from there, I picked up the matter of Helen Gay, the first African-American uh, woman on the city council. And then we look back to breaking the color barrier from 1897 to 1903, uh, the African-American town commissioners, which lived across town in Happy Hill. So it was five or six, and then we had postmasters. And in church, uh, one of the young ladies read the history of Weeks Armstrong and how he was uh, uh, ran out of his position because of embezzlement. Right. And I got up and said, that was never proven. Right. Just like the stuff they try to do with Reuben, right, that man. they cannot prove with the right. state auditors because we're fighting for our people and fighting for this community. All right now. And so we got to stop letting people tar and feather your leaders and That's stop right. letting other folks yes, choose your leaders. That's right. And so with the historic markers, it was not until we became the majority in 2003 that we started erecting local historic markers. Markers like the Douglas House, which was torn down. We asked them not to. Uh, the Anna Easter Brown marker. And then with the Phoenix Society, the, his, uh, the highway markers. So we have had more knowledge of African American history in the last 12 years than we, 16, than, than we have had pretty much ever in Rocky Mount. And so I know I got too many. So what I want to say, the history 
I know the history of the homes, and that's why it was so important to save the Holy Hope Church. That's right. Because I heard Dempsey Cotton, I heard Mary and Lewis, I heard the Stokes talk about that church and the character of it. It was this, it was it was dilapidated and pigeon living there. But then when you walk in and you can see beyond the deterioration and saw what it was and what it could be. And then Miss Rose Hunter over there with the Mitchell House, what it was and what it's going to be. And when this council saw the Douglas Block, when they said, push it down, it's a red light district, but look at it now. Come on now. The Booker T. Washington, they said, oh, this tear it down, but look at OIC. And when Dr. King first spoke, he had, I have a dream speech. All the history, they tell us that it's not history tear down, rebuild. We got to have visionaries like Joyce Dickens, who went on Washington Street. And then you look at Harambe, which is unity. And so what we got to do is to embrace our past and work towards our future. And that's what we're doing here in the city of Rocky Mountain. So let's tell our own story, preserve our own history, and let's continue to build this community, not just for African Americans, but for everybody. But don't forget where we come from, and let's do it together. All politicians that out, right? Okay, so we want you all to have a chance to dialogue. Some questions or comments, and Savannah will take. You want to take this mic? She'll bring that mic to you. Questions? We got one over here. I'll help. Savannah, you start. Hi, I live in a house, a Sears and Roll Up house that was built in 1899. Uh, Mr. Parker built the house, and uh, one of the things about Sears and Roll Up houses, they were, he mailed everything in the house, including the nail, the bathroom. Mm. The house has got the original floors from 1899. I walk on them every day. But here in Rocky Mountain, there are so many houses that were built by the students at Booker T. Washington High School. Next door to me, Mrs. May Parker lived in one of the houses that was built by uh, the students from Booker T. Washington High School. Across the street, the Thompson House is a house on Myrtle Avenue that was built by students. And these houses get no recognition. And, some of, and I think there's a house on Applemore Street that was built. There's a brick house on Applemore Street that was bricked up by the student from Booker T. So I think we should look into preserving these historical houses. I don't know how to go about getting the records to show who did this house. Okay. But I think you should look into it. Joe? Am I on? Mm -hmm. I don't want you to talk about my the bass in your voice, but I'm good. I'm from Columbia, South Carolina. I grew up in a house that basically is now the size of one of my rooms in my houses here in Miles in Rocky Mountain. I have been in 56 countries and 47 states. There are two examples of where we can be. I like Atlanta. I'll say that you're busy today. I've been to Gary, Indiana, a city that is deteriorating all around itself. I think we have to have a holistic vision, especially for you four up there, for the city of Rocky Mountain, and then how we preserve who we are. I think there are some great things. I love this building, by the way, what you've done here. This is a great vision because it ties to something mm -hmm. that we have. And I would ask you that one, we redesign or, and try to figure out, we can't save every building. Because some buildings, if we try to preserve those buildings, we will, we will make ourselves an eyesore or look like we've just been doing a bunch of additions as opposed to moving forward. I would recommend that one, to capture both what we heard tonight 
and examples of some of the structures that were important to our history, we make a museum, a Rocky Mountain Museum that has in it the power of Rocky Mount to this nation and to the state. And then you can and build it down here because it will bring people to here. I found more folks from Rocky Mount around this country by accident. So we have a great history. And I say we because I chose to be here. And partly because we have a strong group of African Americans and proud of it. But we've got to make sure we understand we have a vision to go forward with the kind of things that you and your IT world can bring, with the religions and faiths that we have inside of this place. But we cannot keep our feet planted in the past. Capture it and make sure that our youth have that to move forward. Okay. It's Jim uh, right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. I'm Adolph, American Muslim. You're going to have to put it close to your mouth. You just have to put it close. My name is Leroy Williams. I'm Adolph, American descendants of slavery. This is who we are. We often ask for diversity. Look around. Aren't we tired of picking top of everybody? Are we tired of pinning the field for everyone? If we had our generational wealth, we have to ask for flat. <coughs> Marcus, we have to ask for Marcus. No, we wouldn't. I went to Miss Helen Gay's house today. $61,000 to purchase it. Walk through Who's got the money to buy it? We need, where do we go from here? We need to go for reparation. And the reason for that, our descendants, as someone said tonight, my father had a third grade education. My mother had a sixth grade education. Eight children. And they had to provide for I have, and all of my brothers have education. They made sure we got that. We're smarter, but we don't have the generational wealth that was denied us during Reconstruction, during the GI Bill, and through every facet of this country, we have been excluded. Whether we go from here, the city councilmen have a job to do concerning unity, the city. They need all push. They need the baby boomer push for the history, for the wealth that we have to pass up. And I heard a lot about businesses tonight. Where are they? How come they do not exist today? Because of the wealth being in having to compete with other businesses. I'll leave you with that because I know my time. Very well said. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, Sabah, I think, uh, Sue Perry. And Doris, just one second. The panel has asked me to make sure I acknowledge, and I should do this on my own accord, that we that we also have Representative Shelley Willingham with us. <laughs> and he can make for himself, as, as Ruben said, our Dred Wimberly. You know, the first the uh, black representative since Reconstruction from Edgecombe County. So if there's some comment you want to make as we wrap up, we want to make time, make way for you to make any, you just jump in or indicate if you want to make a comment. Doris? Sue, Sue. Doris, I, I just want to commend the city of Rocky Mountain for having this event. And um, to let, you know, history is important. History is the fruit for our future. <coughs> So how we honor it is how we restore and prepare for the greatness that's yet to come. Hearing you talk about it, hearing that there are houses 
Edgecombe Community College does have a historical restoration program where they can train for restoration. We have all of these churches. We have these male fellowships where I'm looking at the young people and if we could get them trained and start targeting some of these houses that we want to have restored to preserve our future. I think the history is the fruit for our future. Now we need to eat it and plan what are we going to do. Our forebears came here in 1619, starting with Christmas Eve. We were repressed, we were enslaved and everything to 1863. So we didn't have during those years, we couldn't do anything with our thoughts. And then we had to go through the reconstruction. And we were enslaved, trying to be free people in a restricted environment. So we haven't, some of us are disappointed. I was disappointed we haven't done more. Then I had to think about what we've come through in a short period of time. So I commend your progress. I commend the work. We are here on the backs of those. Those homes were built, not with a chainsaw, not with an electric saw, with a hammer and a nail and a handsaw. And if our forebears can do all of that, take this fruit and build our future. Our panel wanted to make some closing remarks. We got TJ, who's going to pray us out and sing, lead us in lift every voice and sing. But before that, Marcus is going to talk a little bit about voting, et cetera, uh, before in, that, uh, in, that, in this mix. So we're going to let you uh, be the, have the last comment. I, I think we have to be thinking far down the road. And what we need to do, I think, is inventory what's in these neighborhoods. So I'm saying to the members of the city council, we may need to get some money to get that inventory conducted. I know we can't save everything, but some of the people that lived over there, they participated after reconstruction in the General Assembly. I see a walking tour, and by the way, that wayfinding, some of that signage got to point to open these neighborhoods. It cannot be pointing everywhere else and ignore our neighborhood. So I just wanted to say those things. And we, we don't have all the answers tonight, but we know that there is something of value that we need to be very, very careful with how we handle it before we start tearing it down. And that signage, that signage you're talking about was that wayfinding signage was a major part of this plan mm -hmm. that you were mentioning. Okay, let's uh, close out with remarks that you all would like to make, and then we will hear from Martha. And I know we'll. I think that I literally want to say to Lamont, who's not here tonight, um, and Angela, and Ruben, and Andre, I think that we really need to give uh, these guys a standing applause for being that first majority of black leadership on the city council. If they hadn't fought those early battles, we wouldn't have had none of this today. I just want to say that. Uh, thank you again to the committee for such an awesome event, a very informative uh, for us all. Uh, but as we're leaving, I would challenge us all, uh, even as we look around, to engage your children, your children's children. Because for those of you that are here in the room, it's hard for us to build for something if we feel like we don't have anything to build for. So if our children aren't here, our grandchildren aren't here, who do we feel like we're building for? And sometimes it's, I feel that's why it's a huge uh, generational gap within our communities, uh, because we, we, we just have lost our uh, connect between our children and our children's children. So I just challenge you all to reconnect with your children, with your children's children. Uh, do the very best you can to get them involved, uh, 
there's some way that we could try to do some things that may appeal to the younger generation. Uh, that would be in the generation. Yeah, in the generational conversations. But uh, thank you all for coming, and uh, I think we're moving forward here in the right way. I just want to say we're almost at the conclusion of our program, and uh, we need a, another session or another setting such as this so we can continue to, to plan and to strategize. Um, a lot of us in this room have a lot of history, and it's we at the eve, eve of it at this point. And so what we need to do is to come together, collaborate, that we can identify and preserve and then capture this history that we just heard tonight and make it written history instead of oral history. Yes. And um, this continue to um, support us as we continue to build Rocky Mount and, and surrounding areas. Thank you all for coming. And, but I'd like to just say very quickly, um, I appreciate um, Sue, the um, great strategy that we've already had conversation about that we fully support. And that's doing a complete inventory of our communities. In fact, I believe we spoke it out at our last council meeting this past Monday that when the um, historic districts were created in the 70s and in the 80s, they only went to predominantly white communities. They gave a summary acknowledgement of a few structures in black communities, but nothing was documented, and there was no outcry from our communities because we did not understand what the whole game was about. But now we are enlightened. And so what I would say is that for our community, I want to thank all of us, all of you who supported us in allocating funding for this $50 million event center. Have you seen how this changed everything in Rocky Mount? Well, it's going to take more money to do a comprehensive overhaul of our inner city communities. It's going to take a lot of money, and it's going to take strategy. So I'm going to ask you not to buy into this whole narrative about we don't need taxes. You hear what I'm saying, y'all? Yeah. It's going to take money yeah. to preserve and salvage. And then we need creative strategies so that money is only allocated to people who have money. We need to be able to work with folk who live beside a deteriorating home and say, I want to buy that home and do it myself. We can do some things if we have creative vision and we stick together. And we can't say our structures. So I hope that um, we just stick together, and move together, and value ourselves as much as we value inclusion with other folks. Thank you. Uh, Representative Wilkham, and then we will turn it over. Thank you. I, I'm going to try to be brief. Um, I've enjoyed this, and I, I certainly think that we should applaud the uh, people who put this on because this is. <laughs> It's ironic that this happened today. Uh, when I came here, I came from a meeting in Raleigh. Uh, I'm on a select committee, which is studying codes and enforcement for the state. And our whole discussion, uh, three hours of it, we were talking about how we can make it easier for developers. And, and the idea of affordable homes, you know, was kind of supposed to be a sub kind of things we talk about, but we talk very little about that, but we talk a lot about how we make it easier for people to come into communities and take over property. Mm. Uh, so that's interesting. Mm. Now this is going on, and this is happening. Um, and I can go on and on about that, but, but that's what's happening in Raleigh. And I know Mark is going to talk about, you know, what is the voting and stuff, but again, I, I want to say to you as a politician, I'm afraid of this election. Hmm. I mean, I, and I'm serious. Because if we don't do what we need to do in this election, we're in for a, a rocky road. 
Now, many of us that are sitting here, we'll probably be all right. I mean, you know, but it's not about us, me, you know, you. It's about all those folks that we say we represent and that we say we care about. So I, I employ you. And again, like I said, I am actually afraid, you know, the way this uh, political atmosphere is going right now. And, and I beg you, you know, that it is serious. It is serious. Uh, and I, I don't know how I can, I was supposed to be down in South Carolina for uh, debate and stuff, but there was some other stuff going on, and like I say, there's a lot of stuff that's going on, and, and uh, people out there working, and it's really going to affect us, black folks. You know, it's going to affect us, those of us of color, we're going to get the blood of this. So please, you know, do what you're supposed to do. Make sure that you get people out to vote, uh, because if you don't, you know, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, and, I, and I didn't mean to just talk about that, but that, that's, that's where we are. And, and I, I'm just, and I, and I tell you, when I travel around the state, you know, I brag about Rocky Mountain, I know somebody mentioned about what it's been accomplished, might not be enough, but, you know, we know that uh, it hadn't been that long since we've been in a position where we can make things happen. But I brag about Rocky Mountain, and I'm going to ask everywhere I go, people say, well, gee, you guys are really doing it in Rocky Mountain. So we're being noticed, and, and we're not talking about just here in North Carolina either. Because we have made some accomplishments and moved forward that uh, people just didn't think it would happen. But of course, if we don't keep working at that, I mean, we're going to lose it. So there's a lot at stake for what we're doing, and, and anything that I can do to assist, you know, I'll gladly do that. And, uh, and I'll gladly put my life on the for what we're all about. Because I'm not sure that we do need to do I'm okay. I, I know Angela said I, uh, she didn't want me to speak, but uh, but I know no, you said didn't have time. But I'm just saying I want to say that I came to work five o'clock this I mean seven o'clock this morning. Got off at four five thirty. I'm here now and got to be back over here two o'clock tonight. All I want to say is, uh, uh, Real Walker, you're talking about uh, getting your children involved. It's about children, but I've been fighting didn't, when I didn't have any children because I fought for the elderly the middle age, and everybody, because it ain't about me. And I, I didn't have to fight, because I grew up, had everything, but it ain't about me. And so when we take the attitude that it ain't about us, but my main thing I want to say is, you young coming on this, on this council, I was there when Andre Knight came on it, well, I was there way back there when uh, uh, Miss Helen Gay and Angela and all of them, when, when Reuben, we appointed him. But I want to say that if we don't get behind our young black men, because Rocky Knight has lost a lot of time and progress because when they single out Andre, I told him they were going to fire him when he was working for Edgecombe Community College when he bought that house on Falls Road. They fired him. And people sit back and allow them to attack him. They still attack him today. If you don't get behind your black leaders and stand behind them and stop letting them uh, tell our story, you're going to lose everything. So, Reverend Walker, you're coming on board. Don't get caught up in the mess. Do what you got to do. Let them talk. But re remember, it's about us. There you go. <laughs> All right. So look, everybody is ready to go. It's, it's, it's nine o'clock. My name is. Uh, but I, so I will be very brief. Um, my name is Marquez Thompson. I'm with Democracy North Carolina. And basically, I want to talk now. I know this group understands the importance of voting. If you understand Black history, you understand the importance of voting because voting is. is a part of black history, and that's, that's what we do. So I, I, there's no need to encourage y'all to vote, but what we do have to do is, as it's been mentioned before, is to make sure that our friends and our family vote. It should be 100% voting participation in the African American community. And that has got to be the standard that we live with. We say, if you're going to be a part of my family, my community, you got to vote. I'm sorry. So, so I, and I think that's the way we go. So one of the reasons why, we, one way we can help with that, though, is to understand why people don't vote, right? One of the main reasons why people don't vote is because they don't really know who's on the ballot. They don't, they don't know the candidate. They don't have enough information. And that is one way you can be a great help to your friends and neighbors. On your table right now, 
You have a ballot that has been so lovely passed out. You can find the ballots like this in places like democracync.org. You can go to the state board of elections website. You can go to um, the, the League of Women Voters have a website, Voter 411. You can get that ballot. Take it to your friends and your neighbors and show them who's on the ballot. Tell them what you know about those candidates. Therefore, they will know what they, nobody's going to get in line or do anything. They don't know who these people are or what they, what they do. So we have to give them that information. We can't just say vote, and that's all it is, too. We have to give them reasons to vote. We have to give them the, the opportunity to vote. So that's one. But another thing I think we should do is be ready to, to counter the narrative that is out there that your vote doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. There have been countless elections right here locally that have been decided by fewer than 10 votes. I mean, right, right down the road. We flipped the coins for votes and all kinds of stuff like that. Your vote matters locally. The President Obama, you know, a lot of people would, would care about that. He won by less than a few votes per precinct. So if a few people in that precinct didn't get up and vote, then it wouldn't have been no President Obama. So, so that, your vote matters even on a presidential level, right? But I also think that we need to get people out of this thing about voting for Winning, like if I don't win, then my vote didn't count. That is a, when you vote, you get your voice heard, that's winning. That's a win. If you think about places like, um, we talk about flipping Georgia, flipping, uh, the Democrats are talking about that, I'm, I'm not a partisan. Flipping Georgia, flipping, flipping Texas. The only way that's possible is because years and years and years and years, people voted and lost. But you know what they said? We're here. We're here, you can build on us. I'm here, I ain't going nowhere. And when you have those voters saying, I'm here, then, and they're gonna stay, then you can build on it. The same thing with Republicans, you know, uh, for years people said Pennsylvania could never go red. It went red, because years, voters were there, they were saying, hey, we're here. And if y'all mess up, Democrats will, it'll flip. So, so, so don't get it twisted. When you vote, you win. When you make your voice heard, you win. So. We need to twist those narratives. We need to give people the information that they need. If you don't know, ask somebody, Google, talk to your friends and neighbors. Um, the things that I get people to vote about with me is who do I have access to, right? Who are the candidates that are talking to people like me? I look at this, this city council right here. You have a Black History uh, Month celebration. You get the leaders in your community that come to it, support it. Then you say, you know what? They support the stuff that I care about. So I might be. I need to support these people. So that's how, that's how you make those decisions. You look at issues. Who are the people that are supporting your issue? That's who you vote for. So you help people to know who to vote for and help them to know what's at stake. They will vote. Last thing I say, I know I've been talking fast because I know everyone's ready to do <coughs> But we've been talking about Christ all day long or since we've been here. Jesus, with one of the last conversations he had with Peter, he got personal with He said, look, if you love me, you're going to take care of my sheep, right? He said, love, love me, you're going to love my sheep. Right? So we got to get personal with people in our family. We got to get personal with people in our community and say, listen, okay, if you love me, you got to make sure your voice is heard. It's important to me. If, if they say, well, I don't know who to vote, I don't have one, well, say, just, if you love me, magnify my voice. I'll tell you who to vote for. If you don't know, you don't think it matters, it matters to me. So, so look, we'll go down the ballot and I'll tell you, I want this person in the office, I want that person in the office. You support me if you can't support yourself. You need to tell your friends and neighbors, if you love me, you will vote. And we gotta be unequivocal about it. And when we do that, you will win. Looking back to move forward, remember those words, and now we turn it over in closing to Reverend Walker. Before uh, Reverend Walker comes yeah. on this ballot, there's two names <laughs> we ain't endorsing. But one of the persons, NC Auditor, got our heads on the chopping block and got our hotel project jacked up. So the Lord brought us out of the woods, didn't he? Oh. <laughs> but don't go back. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Think about that. What? I didn't call no names. Still this out on the table. You can get information about who's going to be on your ballot, what they do, we'll email it to you. So just do this out. Let them know I'm on your person. And so I get to say, hey, I'm on here. I'll talk to people. But also, you will get information about it.
And there are people in this room who can give you information. So check in with people before you leave. So TJ, you sing the this every voice. Pray right. whichever order you want to do it. Paul Marsh and Monica Clay, let us stand if you are able. We'll sing live every voice together. And we'll close out the benediction. Lift every voice and sing till I bend heaven. Ring with the Let us all say together, amen. 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 amen.